So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer, and I'm head of strategy and industry engagement at 67 Bricks. And I'm going to be talking today about artificial intelligence and machine learning in the scholarly ecosystem. Um, very briefly, you might be wondering who 67 Bricks are. Uh, we're based in Oxford in the UK. And we partner with publishers, mainly in the scholarly and society space, to evolve their data and content capabilities. And in doing that, we use approaches like machine learning, AI, natural language processing, um, to build platforms and products and services for publishers. And artificial intelligence, as I'm sure you're aware, is generating a lot of interest in press coverage at the moment. Um, Organisations like Google, Facebook, IBM, Microsoft, they're all investing huge, huge sums of money into AI. Um, but I do want to frame this presentation just by quickly defining what we mean when we talk about artificial intelligence. Um, so a definition. Artificial intelligence is the use of computers to stimulate, simulate human intelligent behaviour in order to tackle complex problems that are difficult to solve using traditional computational approaches. Ugh. So let's break that down a little bit. Um, so we're aiming to simulate human intelligent behaviour. Um, but actually, one of the things that's been holding AI back is the intention to mimic exactly how the human brain works. And more recently, the approaches that have worked have identified and understood the differences between humans and computers. Uh, so the human brain has a huge, huge processing power, but actually very limited ability to hold and store and access large quantities of data, um, whereas that's obviously something that a computer will excel at. And we're thinking about complex problems, right? And what a complex problem actually is, is determined by your point in history. So if I'd said to you 15 years ago, I was going to give you a device, it's going to fit in your pocket, and it's going to give you directions completely on the fly from my house in Oxfordshire, um, all the way to the McGill University Conference Centre using a uh, bus, train, plane, taxi, um, right in a matter of seconds, you'd have been pretty amazed back then. And you probably would have thought about that as being something like AI. Uh, but now that we have it, it just seems totally normal, right? It's just software. So typically, AI seems to be the thing that's just over the horizon. Um, and it also tends to be focusing, focused on performing a particular task or solving a particular problem. Um, in this case, fetching directions for me. Um, and finally, the comparison to traditional computational approaches is an interesting one. So software development has traditionally been achieved by software developers uh, writing individual rules and then creating libraries of those rules and building on those libraries of rules, all about rules. Um, but in modern AI approaches, we just give the system the data and it works out the rules um, automatically and dynamically as it gets more and more data. And there are lots of different approaches in artificial intelligence, um, but the one that's really gathering a lot of kind of momentum and interest at the moment is machine learning. Um, and in fact, something like 60% of the money and investment that's going into AI is going straight into machine learning. And we say that a software application is using machine learning when its performance in a particular task improves over time. Um, with experience. Um, and there's a couple of things that's worth noting there. So it's, it's really important to frame and define that task correctly. Um, and also getting the experience data is a really interesting challenge. And it's, it's actually an opportunity for many of us in the room. Um, a lot of machine learning companies are going to be looking for data. And as an industry, we are sitting on top of lots and lots of very, very valuable data that we absolutely should not undervalue. Um, so we've talked about machine learning being used to perform a particular task um, and improving over time, but I'm reckoning that probably seems quite abstract. So I have got a very simple machine learning demo to show you now. Um, please be kind because it's a live demo, so hopefully everything will go well. Um, and you'll have noticed that people love to give AI assistants names, right? So we have Siri, Cortana, Alexa. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to my assistant, Albert Einstein, and we're going to teach him about physics today. Um, so unlike his famous namesake, um, Albot currently knows absolutely nothing about physics. Uh, we're going to have to train him. And I am going to ask you to be shouting out um, some things to me. So please uh, get involved. Uh, so just bear with me. OK. So hopefully you can all see that. Um, so imagine you're a publisher, um, a journal publisher, and you want to pull together a collection of content all about laser physics, say, um, in response to the latest Nobel Prize announcement. Um, 
what might you do at the moment? You might um, search in particular journals, like one or two journals that you know tends to publish in that field. Uh, you might search by keyword, uh, author name. Um, you might use metadata that's been assigned by the author or the academic editor or production staff, and you might have 12 production staff, and they're all doing that slightly differently because they're all different people. Um, so it's probably going to take you a bit of time, and it's you're probably going to miss stuff, right? Um, and wouldn't it be nice just to press a button and kind of pull that stuff off automatically? Um, so that's what we're going to train Albot to, to do today. We're going to train him to identify five different categories in physics. Um, I know that in the real world there are many more than five categories, um, but for the sake of the demo, let's, let's go with that. Um, so our categories today are laser physics, mathematical physics, cosmology and astrophysics, biomedical physics, and physics education. And we've got here a corpus of, I think, around 50 um, abstracts and titles. They're all completely real, untampered with um, scientific abstracts. Um, and as I say, we're going to train Albot to assign which category it is automatically. Um, so let's look at the first one. Um, the first one, pancreatic cancer a mechanobiology approach. Uh, so this talks about cancer biologists, oncologists, talks about um, treatment and therapies. Um, so which category do we think this is? Anyone? Biomedical, yep, I think so. Um, so I'm gonna tell Albot that that one's biomedical. Um, and you'll see he makes that green. He now knows for sure that that one's biomedical because a lovely human has told him. And he makes uh, a, a reasonable guess, you might say, that actually they're all biomedical, right? <laughs> now, he's never seen anything but biomedical, um, so, you know, let's, let's, let's forgive him. Um, but he obviously needs more data to be able to um, make some more informed decisions. So uh, let's look at the second one here. Uh, Non-Newtonian gravity on the property of strange stars. Cosmology, cosmology yep. So we'll tell him that one's cosmology. Ooh. And so what he's doing now is he's looking at the, um, the text and abstract here um, for both of the examples, and he's basically working out what makes each one unique. So he's looking for keywords, assessing the relative importance of those keywords. Um, essentially, you might say creating a fingerprint um, of, of each example and, and then comparing that against the fingerprint of all the other examples that we have here. Um, and what he's saying now, based on the two examples that he's got, is that 27 of them look more like the biomedical example, and 21 of them look more like the cosmology example. Um, so he, he needs an example from each category to be able to assign them all. So hopefully we can, we can give him that. Um, so this one here, um, passively Q-switched erbium-doped fiber laser based on, yeah, so clues in the title, laser. Um, and we haven't, we're not telling him here that, you know, when it's laser physics, you're looking for these five words or, or anything like that. We're just saying, this is laser physics. You know, find out what makes it unique and come find us some more examples. Um, next one. So, systematic solutions of evolutionary partial differential equations. Dif Mathematical. Mathematical physics. You guys are good at physics. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, so we tell him that's mathematical physics. Um, and you'll see now that he's assigning um, examples in each of the categories, apart from education, right? Because he's never seen education, doesn't know what that looks like. Um, but this next one here, teaching guide of nuclear physics, I think that's, that's pretty clear that that's going to be education. Um, and probably the one underneath it as well, so working with the nature of science in the physics class. I think to you or I, it's pretty clear they're both education. Um, but when you think about it, there's, there's not really any overlapping words here um, other than the physics in the title. I'm, I'm sure there might be in the abstract. Um, so at the moment, he's saying this one's biomedical and this one's maths. And I'm hoping that when I tell him this one's physics education, he might change his mind about this one. So let's see. Yay. Brilliant. Um, so he's changed his mind based on what we've now told him physics education looks like. Um, and in machine learning, it's just as important to verify when the machine gets something right as it is to tell it when it's got something wrong. Um, so what I'm going to do is tell Albot. Well done, Albot. You've got this one right. Um, and watch what happens to the education category here. Yep. So he's, he's more confident now about what makes something physics education. So he's, he's, he's tweaked um, what he's saying there. Um, OK, let's look at a couple more. So uh, observe properties of dwarf galaxies. He's saying cosmology? Yeah. 
brilliant. Um, oh, but this one has cosmology actually in the title, but he's plumping from mathematical physics. Um, and I guess what's happening there is there must be some words um, in the abstract that, that's making him think that. And, and bearing in mind he's only ever seen one example of maths before um, and two examples of cosmology, that's probably fair enough. Um, let me see, so it's got numerical studies, um, zero negative potential, um, but he's wrong. So let's tell him it's, it's cosmology, right? Um, and, and maybe watch what happens to the numbers at the top because I, I expect them to change here. Yeah, so, so I think especially maths and cosmology there, um, he changed his mind, he's more sure about that now that he's got more verified training data from us. Okay, so just a few more. Um, radiotherapy planning using MRI, he's saying biomedical, yeah? Brilliant. Um, a fast direct sampling algorithm for equilateral closed polygons. Yep, well done. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, let's just look at one more. So uh, multiple optical cages generated by focusing a Laguerre cosine Gaussian. Oh my goodness. So optical focusing beam. Um, I think he's got that right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you can see now that actually he's getting the bulk of these, these correct. And I'll scroll down a bit more so that you can have a look at a few more examples. Um, and that's only with a few minutes of, of training from us um, as, a, as a group. Um, so if I was a journal publisher now, I could hopefully click one of these buttons and pull off a, a pretty half-decent list of all my laser physics um, titles in my corpus. Um, obviously, that's a very simplistic example. Um, in the real world, you'd have overlapping um, areas. Um, you might want to do different things. So you might want to weight the um, words in the title um, over the abstract. You might want to look at the full text. Uh, we've had quite a lot of success actually with using reference lists, so the articles that a paper cites is a, is a good way of finding out what it's about. Um, but I'm hoping that you, you can see from that um, just how quickly you can start to do something pretty meaningful with uh, machine learning and academic content. So I'm going to try and get back to my presentation. Cool. Um, so we've built on technology like this um, to begin to start to power all sorts of really useful features. So things like uh, better content discovery, uh, driving usage, personalizing experiences, um, a journal finder tool for authors. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, an author can come along, upload their raw manuscript, um, and it might say, OK, of the 40 chemistry journals I know about, these are the three that I think um, your paper aligns to pretty well. You might get accepted. Why not submit there? Uh, uncovering interdisciplinary connections, um, content collections, of course, augmenting peer review, and perhaps creating that metadata automatically. Um, so I wanted now to pick out some examples of AI and machine learning that's already in use um, from people that you've likely heard of. Um, I'm not affiliated in any way with these people, um, but I just thought they were really good examples of what's already happening out there in this space. Um, so in Kristen Ratten's keynote yesterday, it was suggested that the, perhaps the biggest improvement that journal publishers could make to the author experience um, is to reduce the time it takes for articles to get published. And so Taylor and Francis have recently announced something they're calling contextualized copy editing. And they're using AI and natural language processing to assess the language quality of accepted articles so that they can then route them to the appropriate level of copy editing. So if an article doesn't need editing, it automatically goes down that minimum intervention route. So basically it's eliminating unnecessary production time, but importantly, still ensuring that if an article does actually require editing, it gets that editing. And I have spoken to companies who want to take this one step further and start applying AI to the task of basic editing. So I think that's something we're probably going to hear more about in the future. Um, Harvard Medical School and Elsevier, they've partnered to build a prototype tool to detect inappropriately duplicated images in content that's been accepted for publication. Um, so this duplication, it's, it's nine times out of ten, it's the result of basic human error. So someone's just uploaded the wrong file um, from one of the hundreds of files on their computer. Um, but in some cases it can be a sign of academic misconduct uh, where a figure's been deliberately changed um, or manipulated to change the meaning of the research. 
Um, and this tool is using data analysis and machine learning to draw from vast, vast amounts of data that you know, a human could never retain or process. Um, so I think it's pretty likely that this is going to become a standard tool at Elsevier um, and something that other journal publishers or perhaps submission systems might um, look to implement. So a couple of examples for researchers very quickly. Sparrow, I don't know if anyone's heard of that, but it's a science recommendation site. Um, looks very much like a familiar social networking or news aggregation site, um, but it, it includes not just articles on publications, um, sorry, not just updates on publications, but also grant announcements, patents, uh, conference proceedings, and so on. So it's basically everything that a research might need, might need in one place instead of having to scrabble around all over the web. And that's also using natural language processing, and it develops a, a semantic understanding of each researcher and their area of interest um, to push that relevant content to them. Um, and it also tracks the interaction of researchers with other researchers who are using the tool. Um, and it allows you to, um, to rate whether a suggestion is, is actually relevant or not. So a bit like what we did when we were training Albot. Um, we told him his guesses were right or wrong, so that um, with an increase in usage, this gets more and more accurate. Uh, so finally, Iris uh, automates, semi-automates the existing process of narrowing down a, a precise reading list. Um, this is something that without Iris, uh, people say, takes about two to four weeks. Uh, researchers claim to get this about 70% accurate. And Iris is claiming to uh, reach 85% accuracy in just a couple of days. Um, but one thing I really like personally about Iris is that you can start with a problem statement or a hypothesis um, of, of, that you're trying to solve. So it cuts down on keyword search, just eliminates that, creates a fingerprint of your problem statement, and then matches that fingerprint against tens of millions of open access papers that are out there in the wild. Um, so those are just a few examples that I liked. Um, working on scholarly content, we do come across a lot of areas of opportunity to utilize AI and machine learning. Uh, these are some examples that I saw that are relevant to researchers. So asking questions instead of inputting search terms is a nice one. So being able to say something like, show me papers that disputes this paper, or you know, to what extent do these two papers agree with each other. Understanding trends in research, but also grant and funding trends, discovering interdisciplinary connections. So it's, it's never going to be possible for a human to read every paper in the world. And I think AI can help us spot connections between quite seemingly disparate pieces of research that otherwise would be missed. And these are some areas of opportunity for publishers. Um, so we've already talked about some of these, such as improving discovery, creating content collections, automating internal checks and processes, predicting high impact research is a nice one, an interesting one. Augmenting peer review, so that might be finding a suitable journal to transfer to if a paper isn't quite suitable for the journal it's submitted to, but it's, you nevertheless, you want to retain that author, it's, it's good research. Um, performing completeness checks, so things like you've uploaded seven figures but you've cited nine, this is the kind of thing that could be automated, and, and more intelligent plagiarism checks than what we already have. Adaptive learning is a really nice example from the educational world. Um, obviously, we don't have time to talk about all these um, in this forum, but yeah, if you do want to chat about any of these, please catch me afterwards. Um, so I wanted to ask, is all this automation going to be a good thing? What do people think? Yes? No? Yeah? That's quite positive. Okay. So it's quite difficult to predict. And yeah, Stephen Hawking was quoted as saying that AI will either be the best or the worst thing ever to happen to humanity. So he's hedging his bets there. And, um, I think ethically there's a lot to work through. So you've, you've probably all heard the news this week about Amazon's sexist recruitment tool that uses AI. Um, and in fact, it's not the tool that's sexist at all, right? It's, it's the training data, which is essentially Amazon's previous hiring decisions for the past however many years. That's, that's what's sexist there. Um, so it's repeating the errors of humans. Um, and this is a concern, I think, using AI in peer review. We've, I, I, there's been a few talks about using AI in peer review. Um, and so any human bias in decisions that have happened about previous publications could then result in an ethically dubious system, right? So I think it's, it's my view for scholarly columns that it's crucial that there's still some human oversight. Um, in the peer review example, we need domain experts to work with AI to ensure that it's rejecting things based on legitimate issues. Um, so basically, we need, we need humans to ensure that the algorithms aren't mistakenly keeping good and worthwhile research from being published. 
Um, and over 50 million articles, right? scientific papers have been published. This is since people started counting, and this figure is from 2010. So it's, it's hard to measure, but it's going to be much higher than that now. And that this, is more, this is more valuable data and research than anyone could possibly comprehend. Um, AI can help us spot connections that can lead to new discoveries. And I think it's worth mentioning as well that our current publishing model creates an opportunity for predatory publishers to take an author's money and publish their work just without any scrutiny, and that, that's bad, right? And the fact that that happens at all, let alone as frequently as it does happen, I think tells me at least that there's not enough capacity within the publishing community to process the amount of scientific writing that's being generated. And I think AI solutions hopefully can help us address this. So I'm, I'm going to finish now on this quote from Joseph Qualls, the University of Idaho. Um, so AI is already here, and it's increasingly being used in the tools that we interact with every day. Um, so by going into this with our eyes open, we can ensure, I hope, that any fears that we have would be minimised. I think in terms of scholarly comms, it can pave the way to a more cohesive, contextualised, accessible repository of information. Um, publishers can optimise their processes and just ensure that all the articles are up to standard. Um, it's my hope, personally, that by embracing AI and as working working as experts with AI, we can advance the future of scholarly comms. We can improve discoverability, we can streamline publishing workflows, um, and ultimately help um, enable new discoveries and, and new connections. So that's me, and I'd love to take any questions. Thanks. So, so I don't have a question, but I just want to share ah. something I saw yeah. on Tuesday at the AI conference in London. Oh, okay, yeah. IBM have created a really nice um, set of tools for running models in production, mm -hmm. but with those tools you can set alerts and thresholds in case the model is actually introducing bias in the system. So you can say where the decisions are happening, for example, if an age bias is happening in mm -hmm. the decisions, alert the, the operators. And you can go in and look at the specific decisions and see where the weights in the model have created that bias and then revert the model in production. Uh, and right. So, I think, so this, it's a, this topic is a real live topic, but it's really nice to see the community beginning to build solutions around it. And that, yeah. that, it was a really nice thing to see. Oh, that's really interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Just wanted to share that I know of a research group that has an AI their AI ha has mined all of PubMed mm -hmm. and has written 150,000 original papers, their oh, AI. Oh, wow, yeah. So that's really These interesting. papers have yeah. not yet been put into the scientific literature. They are sampling the papers and having human readers review the papers. Mm -hmm. They contain original sentences written by the AI, original figures developed by the AI, original citation lists, of course. And the comments from the human reviewers who are reading these papers is that they can tell it's AI because the citation lists are much better. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, so there's, there's more change coming. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting, actually. So I, I, had, a, I had a slide originally, which, um, which I, I cut in the interest of time, but it was about, um, about exactly that, about AI creating content and using some of the examples. So there's, there's many examples already out there in, in the world of journalism where AI is producing tweets and short articles and things like that, and you're reading them, and maybe you don't realize they're AI. And there was an example from the Washington Post where the, the, the sort of robot, the AI, put out 10 times more volume than a human, and the accuracy level was, was much higher. So yeah, I, that's, I think there's going to be a trickle down to, to academic papers for sure. This is probably not a very helpful thing to say, but uh, it feels um, weird that we spend all this time writing words down in Word documents and then running complicated AI algorithms to then <laughs> sort of recode them. Would it not make more sense just to start by coding them? Uh, you know, sort of start by Possibly. presenting them in a machine-readable way, I mean. Yeah, I mean, yes, and so we also, I mean, outside the academic world, we're doing quite a lot of work with um, the standards world, um, and so people who read standards documents, they don't, they don't want to read a 200-page document, right? They just want to know what they have to do to build this house to comply with regulation. Um, and standards publishers have, have given them that in a 200-page PDF, right? Um, and that's, that's kind of really unhelpful. Um, 
So we've been doing some work um, with the Netherlands Standards Agency on, on taking um, those 200 page PDFs or what have you um, and extracting out exactly what the, just the, the little granular chunks, this is what you need to do. Um, and each PDF will have hundreds of these. And then you can start to do interesting things like track them, track if the requirements change over the time, track if you're complying with those requirements. Um, so it's, that's it's kind of similar to what you're talking about. Yeah. So Lexus Nexus will be next. Sorry? Lexus Nexus. Legal oh, yeah. <laughs> so one final question because we all have to go to the keynote that starts in two minutes. So how long will it be until the AI, they're writing the papers and doing the science? Oh, I don't know. People? That's an interesting question. <laughs> One to ponder over drinks, probably. <laughs> but no, that's not something that is talked about over the water cooler? I mean, I think, so there, there are tools out there that are already taking, for example, data from lab experiments. And, and as one of the gentlemen mentioned, you know, and piecing that together into human readable text. Um, and I think that that can help get scientific outputs out there faster. I mean, I personally think things like um, kind of, you know, the, the, the creative element of it, the, the sort of creative analysis element of it is very, very difficult um, to do with an AI at this moment, the creative bit. So I think flagging the trends is, is interesting, but then yeah, there, there's more to it than that. Um, but yeah, we'll see. I think it's a nice closing yeah. word. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>